cast, uh, although in some oversimplification. Again, uh, if it is correct that the Quran was transmitted through consensus and also this consensus has been reported uh, by people like Abu Abdul Rahman al and other people who say that the Quran that they received was one. And also if we have the, f the concept of Tawatur, uh, which says that such a large number of people had transmitted the Quran in the very first generation and to the next generation that any error uh, regarding certitude uh, has to be ruled out and it has to be a perfect match or the perfect uh, transmission of the original. So if this is the case and if it's such a simple uh, premise that, I've, that we've built up uh, in the light of Ahmadi's research, then how do we explain those five Qurans? How do we explain the, such a wide expanse of variant readings found all over uh, our tafsir literature and why is it that they have been held acceptable? I mean, one can say that there was this, uh, this, these variant readings that existed, but one would say that why were they accepted? Because we would expect uh, some certitude being obtained from our religion and the only thing which gives certitude is uh, these two means of historical transfer, uh, consensus and tawatur. And what we further know is that most of these variant readings I mean, if not all, they are actually ahad. Remember, we had I discussed ahad with you, in which they start off with a couple of people, and then they start to proliferate at a certain point of time. So even if they start expanding at a later point of time, since they originated such that a couple of people transmitted them in the first couple of three ladders, uh, we cannot claim that they had this this uh, status of tawatur or consensus. And if this is the case, then why did the Ummah accept or our scholars uh, say that these variant readings are actually the Quran per se, uh, they are nothing but the Quran themselves, when they themselves say that only that thing can be the Quran which is proved through Tawatur. <coughs> See, the, uh, if you appreciate the problem, the problem is that all our scholars, there is not a single scholar, maybe, maybe very few. Uh, hardly an exception who does not say that the Quran has not been transmitted through Tawatur. All of them say, although they do not mention the consensus part, this is the addition which Ramdi Sahib has made I, and uh, I have explained the reasons as well. But this Tawatur part is explained by el almost every Usul scholar. All of them say that the Quran has been transmitted through Tawatur and Tawatur means the same which we have just discussed, that such a large number of people transmitting a piece of information uh, and uh, not uh, gathering on any e uh, any any vice or something which is not faithful to the original transmission. And uh, to give you an example of this tawatur, it's not that this as I, I gave you example of this consensus. Remember, we discussed this consensus vis-a-vis -vis Constantine the Great and and some of the other personalities about which we can say that our own knowledge bank, the way it has been been receiving information over various generations, cannot could not have faltered. Uh, when it received this news that Constantine the Great was the Roman Emperor in the 4th century. In a very similar way, if I give you an example of Tawatur, so that you can see that Tawatur is not something which is confined to the Quran only. Uh, a very stark example of Tawatur in our daily lives is the transmission of a language, any language. Take, a, take the case of the Urdu language or the English language. The words which are transmitted, for example, chair, desk, wall, roof, lights, and complete sentences, they, have, they are transmitted in such a way that we learn about these words not through a dictionary, not through any uh, other means, but because the living tradition that we live in transfers the same meaning gives us the same meaning. So a very good example of uh, language uh, being uh, uh, of, of, of Tawatur is this transmission of a language. They are 90 percent of the language is transmitted. The words are transmitted through Tawatur and we can safely uh, assume that whatever has been transmitted is, is the view of every person. You would not find a single person in this world disputing the fact that this is a whiteboard and it cannot be called a chair. No one will say that this is a whiteboard. 
no one will will say that this is a house so this is this is this is an example to tell you that the meanings of the words and the words themselves of various languages have been transmitted through tawatur and in order to understand how the quran was transmitted of course uh, that that case i'm going to make later on but you need to understand that as far as the quran is concerned it was transmitted through this tawatur and if i can further uh, further specify it this tawatur was actually oral in nature so i call it oral tawatur so when the prophet actually left this world he left the ummah on the consensus of the text of the quran and that text of the quran was perpetually concurrently transferred to each of the next generations primarily in the oral form it's the oral tawatur very similar to the oral tawatur of a language so if anyone asks you is the quran unique in this oral transmission of tawatur you can say no an example a parallel that you can give is the transmission of a language ha what you can say is the only example in which a book has been transmitted orally is unique to the quran however as far as words are concerned proverbs are concerned idioms are concerned many other things which form part of a language they have the same mechanism of transmission as the quran except as i said the only distinction perhaps the only book we can say which has been transmitted uh vis-a-vis -vis oral tawatur the only book is just the quran we don't have any example uh of that except of course uh in in recent times there have been people who have memorized a lot of texts they have memorized a lot of books and when they start transmitting it since we are now in the age of the print uh, media in which things don't need to be memorized they just need to be printed or maybe just disseminated through, through the social media or through the internet or through our emails etc and whatsapps so the nature of that transmission has drastically changed but again the mechanism stays the same it was oral in previous generations and slight and as time went on that oral uh, transmission gave way to written transmission and to soft copy transmission etc etc and this could also vary from time to time so uh, just to go back to that first question as i said that if it is so simple that the quran was transmitted through a consensus and it had tawatur and our every scholar of this umma also says that the uh, quran has to be a mutawatir thing it cannot be a hard thing then how come that they have uh, they accept these variant readings and before their acceptability the question arises that where did they come from it's like saying that where did this fossil these fossils come from uh, although darwin has given us a cogent maybe a cogent explanation if at all he has tried to interpret one way of uh, the existence of these fossils but he has not denied their existence similarly uh, we can interpret one way of the existence of these uh, of these variant readings but we cannot say that they never existed so the first question that i'm going to address now is how did these variant reading come about in the very first place so we don't the case the word to water is actually uh, understood differently within the scholars because some people say just mean the continuity okay the, this difference again uh, I, i left it out purposefully because this difference actually is between the usul e hadith uh, the usul usuliyin and the usul e hadith scholars so the usul e fiqh scholars have their own definition of the watur and this is the one that i am actually presenting uh, the usul e hadith scholars or the hadith scholars have a different version of the watur and uh, that is something which has arisen much later and that is not actually classified as, as the classical the watur so i've left it out and that is primarily the task of uh, of a hadith scholar so i am confining myself to the, to that tawatur in which historical established historical facts are transmitted so i am confining myself to that so the first question that uh, that is that i am liable to answer to you uh, that if it is such a simple phenomena that the quran has been uh, transmitted to oral tawatur and in this oral tawatur there has been no change a very large number of people have transmitted then how come uh, these variant readings exist so first i'm going to answer the existence of those that those variant readings remember we discussed that there is there are whole regions about 11 countries which have these variant readings we'll discuss that in presently in, in my next uh, uh, next question but the first is that how come these variant readings originated where from where did they come from in such large numbers 
So, there are a couple of points that I would like to make here, uh, which might now seem very easy for you to understand. Remember what the Quran said about itself, that it started to be, to be, to be revealed in the Laylatul Qadr somewhere in the time of the Prophet when he had turned 40 years old and it started to get revealed in various installments. And then these installments were all brought together, they were added and then a new arrangement was given to the Quran. Remember that? What does this tell us? It tells us the final arrangement was different to the initial arrangement. Not only that, we have a verse of the Quran which also tells us that perhaps some verses uh, of the Quran were forgotten uh, by the Almighty, uh, were made to forget, the, the Almighty made to forget the Prophet uh, these verses because in the final recension, the final Quran that we have, the Almighty did not deem it appropriate that they should exist and hence either they were, they were cancelled or they were no longer there. So, uh, it seems to me that what happened was that this Arzai Akhira, this is the time when that second compilation took place. Remember the term Arzai Akhira? Remember Al Qiratul Amma? So, Al Arzai Al Akhira and Qiratul Amma took place in this uh, 11 Hijri. The Prophet died in 12 Hijri, Rabiul Awwal. This 11 Hijri uh, Ramazan was the time when this Arzai Akhira took place. And when this took place, uh, the Quran was rearranged, it was revised twice in the Etakaf that took place in his last year between the Prophet and Gabriel himself. It seems to me that what happened was that many of the readings which were perhaps left out of this Arzai Akhira because God did not want them to go along or maybe the tenses of some of the verbs changed. Because you see, now the Ummah had to face the whole world and it was to be given the responsibility of transferring something to the whole world. So it could have been that the verses which were revealed in it, their chronological sequence, some change was brought about in their tenses and maybe some change was brought about in their structure and a new structure was given which was for the final structure. And remember what Farai Sahib said, Faiza Qur'anahu Fatta Bi Qur'ana. When the Quran is recompiled, when it's rearranged, fatta bi Quran. You have to follow the new arrangement. Leave, leave the previous arrangement. Don't even indulge upon it because you might then have a different version of the Quran. So it seems that some readings of the, I would call it arzai ula. This was the arzai akhira. Arzai akhira means the final review or the final presentation. There is this Arzai Ula in which the Quran was being revealed and its chronological uh, readings still existed. So parallel to this final presentation of the Quran, which we have today, these readings still seem to exist. Although the Prophet was told that the Ummah should now abandon that chronological sequence, it never happened, unfortunately. And what happened was when, when the Prophet was told to just adhere to that final revelation, the Sahaba, of course, was, were informed that they have to abandon the previous revelatory sequence, the, re, the previous readings. They must only follow the final recital. They must only follow the final arrangement and reading. And to me, what happened was that some of the companions thought that these original readings, although they are no, no longer valid, they no longer are part of the Quran, but as an academic importance, they still kept them and wrote them down and transferred them to the next generation by telling them, okay, look here, this is the Quran, that is the ultimate Quran. However, since we have heard some other verses of the Quran also in a different way, we would not like to let go of them. So let's keep them as a historical record, much like I kept my presentation as a historical record and I also almost forgot, I almost forgot that I had made a third presentation. Uh, uh, because I thought if I lose the second presentation, there are some, some, some material in it which might be helpful to me. So it's a very natural phenomena that the companions tried to keep a historical record, not because they thought it was Quran, but because they thought that it was a historical record, it had some historical significance. It's like saving the words of good personalities or great personalities and you would not like to sort of lose track of them even if they have gone redundant. If you want to study this phenomena, 
you will find a whole genre of uh, of re, uh, of books which is called in, in urdu it's called baqiyat for example when an author passes away he has he before his death he selects what he'd like to publish and he leaves a lot of material so we have uh, this genre in which the material he'd never liked like to be owned that is published by later generations so we have baqiyat ikbal ikbal actually selected certain books which were part which to him were part of uh, of his ultimate collection and he left out he actually deleted some of the verses but they still remain in record and people after him thought that although ikbal has not selected them let's keep them because uh, even if they have been left out by ikbal they still must must have been of very high level because a person like ikbal if whatever he is leaving out even that is of high caliber so in a very similar vein i think psychologically things worked very similarly that when the tabiun uh, or the people of the after the followers came here and the the sahaba who were right here they transmitted the quran in tawatir to these tabiun to the next generation they made it very distinct look here this is the quran that we have finalized in the arza akhira this is the only quran that you must follow because the prophet has been told fatab e qurana so please make sure of it however since we have also heard the quran its revelatory sequence which was slightly different from this maybe even have a major difference you can preserve it you can preserve it you can preserve it but always instruct your people to whom you are delivering this that this is just of an academic importance it is it does not relate to the quran itself so i make this conjecture i make this educated guess that the sahaba actually transferred the final quran and the quran which was revealed or various reading which were revealed during the time of uh, the revelation of the quran to their students and with the distinction that you must not mix them up however ultimately as time passed on this distinction became blurred I i'll tell you the reason why it became blurred ultimately what happened was that that historical record which was just historical started to merge into the main quran and this distinction that it has mere ec economic importance started to elude us and slowly and surely this mutawatir quran was transmitted amongst the masses everywhere and every place and at the same time this ahad quran if i might call it the khabar e wahid quran which was transmitted by a few people slowly and slowly it actually gained the same importance as the main quran and and the reason that i say that i'm just going to demonstrate before you was uh, let me first complete uh, before i go on to the reason uh, that this is just one explanation of the origin of these variant readings i'd like to give you a couple of more uh, i i would say this is the major this is the major reason of the origin and uh, i can tell you that abdullah ibn masud in his times what he did was when usman tried to confiscate the quran that he had he actually said that i am not going to give him my quran to you because i have heard it directly from the prophet and most probably in the revelatory sequence similarly ubay ibn kaab another very famous companion of the prophet he too is said to have uh, said to umar radhi taala anhu that uh, the quran that i have with me or the readings that i have with me i am not going to give them up which actually sums up the fact that two very famous companions one is ubay the other is ibn masud and the bulk of the readings are bit, are from these two companions they insisted on that academic preservation of the record uh, you know we had several companions but these two companions were absolutely of vital importance and these were the two who who insisted the most that that academic record must be preserved and if you uh look up that uh, book by jeffrey in which we just saw that various uh, the variants you will find a bulk the bu bulk of readings being transmitted either through obai or through ibn masud these were the companions who actually insisted that that the previous reading has to be preserved as an academic record so that uh, uh, anything which is being uh, drawn from the prophet is not sacrificed so i was coming to the fact that this is one of the reasons why they originated so reason number 1 is the arzai ula the revelatory sequence the chronological sequence which was preserved only as an academic uh, thing so that the historical significance is not compromised slowly and slowly and slowly started to merge uh, within uh, within the 
actual text of the Quran and uh, although it remained distinct with various scholars, but many of the scholars who followed actually succumbed to this and they thought that that academic or that historical Quran is also the same as the ultimate Quran which was finally preserved. When right. you started your research, are we saying that these reasons were not clearly articulated and documented as, as we know now? Yep, yep, you know that's what I'm saying. Clearly. Right. And this is, this is really surprising. So that's, that is, I think, the small contribution that I've been able to make, that these are the reasons which, which actually, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. The puzzle was there. The answers were lying with Farahi, Islai, and Ghamidi, but you had to put them in that, in that order in which everything seems to fit. Which hasn't been done which hasn't been done and uh, which, which is my humble contribution I can say but again uh, it could be a long way from that because still there are a number of questions. So the second part, uh, the second reason uh, I, I'd like to point out that as well and that is slightly technical so I'm going to do it in a, in a hurry and maybe you can look it up later on when my book gets published and that is uh, the reason number one was as you can see, the first revelation, mixing up of the first revelation with the final one. The second reason that I can, that I can uh, think of is that uh, anyone who has read the Quran, anyone can see passages who are similar occur and re get repeated in different verses, uh, in different surahs of the Quran. So there are several verses which are repeated in some other surahs with a slight change. There's a very slight change. Is anjainakum, is najainakum. There are several verses. Again, I'm not going to give an example here uh, because uh, it will be more technical. But you'll find that the Quran repeats some of his verses in some of some of the surahs. Not exactly. Not. A, it's not like an exact copy, but with some variation. So I traced these variations and found out that at times this could have happened that a verse which was meant for a particular surah was memorized by a Kari or a Hafiz the way it was and he also memorized the surah with that change with that variation in the other surah. They were separate but as can happen to a human memory because of the similarity of words some words got transferred here and some words got transferred here. It's, it's absolutely uh, I would say a plausible deduction. Words are exactly similar uh, and if, if you have read the Taravi prayer, any of you, whenever you see the, the Same correcting the Imam, often an Imam goes, is, is sidetracked because he suddenly remembers a very similar passage of the Quran and starts reading that and the Same says stop, stop, you are going the wrong way and he gives the clue that this is the right way. So in a very similar way, I think that this happened that similar verses were actually <coughs> at times wrongly, uh, some parts of their words were interposed. And you know what, I actually did a search for that. I spent a lot of time uh, then finding out exact examples. I found out that exact examples in which this misappropriation took place <laughs> do exist. and. Uh, I, 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 I you'll, you'll see it in my own, on my original book that I have given several examples in which this particular reading of a particular Quranic verse is actually associated to a reader of the Quran who has read it differently the way it was read by this person and then it has been very beautifully interlocuted and interchanged so that when you read this you will find out yeah, what, what's going on here because something which is very similar here is also found in a very similar manner here but it will be reported in a different order for example or it could be reported in with a different declension with a different Arab or with a different sequence of Nukat and I found many examples I have given those examples in my, in my book you can see that so to me this is a very very plausible second reason for the origin of these variant readings because of the mixing up of these similar passages a third reason that comes to my mind and which cannot be ruled out is fabrication or concoction. So just as certain ahadith were fabricated, we know that ahadith uh, were concocted in the 3rd or 2nd century, we cannot rule out that actually 
in order to disparage the Quran, certain verses were actually invented or uh, if I may call the word, they were not invented, but they were substituted and with very similar verses so that uh, that fabrication could not be detected. So my third, my, my third contention is that this again is a very, very likely scenario in the case of uh, verses being in, uh, just as ahadis were, were concocted, these qiraat were also concocted. And finally, I have a fourth reason f which I, with which I explain the Shah's qiraat. These are the three reasons which explain the Mutawatir Qiraat. As far as the Shah's Qiraat are concerned, you will find a lot of readings, a lot of readings actually explaining a Quranic word. And that is why they are called Al Qiraat to Tafsiriya. They are nothing but an explanation of a word. And what happened was the explanation was mistaken as the original. Many, I, and I, I even detected that. For example, Fas'aula Zikrillah, which is a verse of Surah Juma, was actually read as Famzaula Zikrillah, which, which is a very similar word. And what actually Abdullah bin Masood was doing at that time, perhaps, he was trying to explain the meaning of Is'au. And he used a similar word to explain it. So many of the Quranic readings that occur are similar, similarly worded just because the companion was trying to explain the meaning of a particular Quranic word to a student of his to make it easier for him to comprehend. And there are some other areas as well in which uh, I can say that uh, the origin, uh, there, there was more than one reason for this origin, but I will leave out uh, some of the other uh, explanations as well. You can look it up because some of them are, are still more technical. So this, this uh, to me is very similar to the fact that these readings have existed. This is like saying that the fossil record is there. Now this, the second question is that, okay, if they are there, if they are there, then why are they held acceptable? <coughs> because all of them are ahad. All of them are ahad. None of them is mutawatir. And this is even accepted by our scholars. They know that none of these readings, these variant readings is mutawatir. Most of them are ahad, but somehow or the other, they are in a fix that if they are ahad, they cannot be the Quran. And if they are mutawatir, it's not proven. So it's neither this nor that. It's like a cash 22 situation. So now the problem which they faced was that if they have, uh, if they have these verses with them, uh, which, which they received, for example, in the third century or the second century, because remember what I, what I was saying is that basically, the Sahaba and the Tabi'un had this distinction in mind that there is a Mutawatir Quran and there is the original, uh, the first revelation Quran which was transferred <coughs> with the distinction that the ultimate Quran is this. But by the time this historical period reached the end of the first century or the beginning of the second century when scholars like Abu Hanifa, Shafi, Malik, they, they were born and they started to give their verdicts, it happened that to them it was said that whenever a khabar wahid reaches you and if it's if it's sanad is isnad is correct if it is reported by reliable means you cannot reject it so therefore when they received a hadith containing these variant readings they were faced with a very huge problem and that is that if they reject these variant readings because they are ahad what right do they have to accept the ahadith of the Prophet was similarly reported. So what they could have done was reject them. If they reject them, by the same token, they should have rejected ahadith also. But since they said that ahadith also carry knowledge and knowledge of the Prophet and they cannot disown them, so they decided to accept them and therefore they had to accept this also. So that's another thing. Uh, when they made this decision, they did not have Do the hmm? scholars of the Ummah. So the scholars of the Ummah, they also did not have the Farahian interpretation of the Qiyamah verse. Otherwise, what they could have easily done was they would have said that if we accept variant readings, it will be against the Quran. 
because the Quran says in Alayna Jama Hu Qurana Faiza Qurana Hu Fatta Be Qurana. There is just one reading of the Quran which was, which was ultimately compiled, and that had to be followed. But since they never interpreted the Quranic verse the way Farai Sahab did, and they actually interpreted it the way Ibn Abbas did, so they did not have even this reference point where they could have gone. <laughs> so now they were in a big fix. If they had to reject these readings, they had to reject all our hadiths. And since they had made up their mind that everything which comes through Khabar Wahid has to be accepted, so therefore, when these variant readings came to them, they had to accept them. Even knowing that they knew it was wrong. Even knowing the fact that they they cannot be termed as the Quran, yeah. because if they term them as the Quran, then the best thing that they can do is they can reject only those readings which are against the Quran. So you see. The the thing that they could have done at best was that if any reading is like saying that any hadith which is against the Quran will not be accepted. So if, if any reading is against the mainstream reading will not be accepted. But what if it explains it? But what if it is very close to it? They would have nothing to reject that. But they must have applied those three principles. But those three principles are constant. So for them, those three principles. Actually, warrant the fact that if those three <coughs> principles do not conform, then those readings would not be classified in the first place. They will be called as the Shah's reading. Was there not even a single person? Not a single person. Who objected? Not a single. Because you see, this was this was the <laughs> collective, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, objective or the collective view which they formed that how can they reject the knowledge of the Prophet, which is coming in thousands and thousands. You see, always remember that the mutawatir part is always very small. It's about five percent of knowledge. The non-mutawatir part, the ahad part, is always very large. This is the case with every history. So they thought, and how can we just disown that part? Except if we have this uh, privilege that we'll only reject that part which is against the Quran. This they did with the hadith also. So regarding the variant readings which were against the the main Quran. They had they had to adopt the same view. They could have they had no other choice. The only choice they ha would have had was if they had interpreted the Quran the way Farai Sahib did regarding Surah Qiyamah, because the Surah Qiyamah verse is is now something which will tell you that if you accept the variant readings, then you are going against the Quran, because the Quran says that only one reading was was ultimately established as the final reading. That was the Qiratul Amma, and that Qiratul Amma was transmitted through Tawatur. Because they never interpreted Surah Qiyamah verse the way Farai Sahib did, so it could never become a reference point. It could never be, have become a reference point for them, and they were in this fix that if they have to accept a hadith, they have to accept this bit into it. I'll try to be even more brief. Uh, now uh, you can now realize the I would say the 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 ordeal, the ordeal with which our traditional scholars had to pass. They knew that they existed. They knew they had to accept them because if they reject them, then on a, by on a similar token they would have to to reject our hadith also. Now, I'd like to give you a small brief regarding the history of these variant readings. If you could turn the slide, uh, still more and the next. Yeah, that's it. So a brief history of these variant readings, especially the ones uh, which have become famous. So the the readings which have become famous are seven. So one of them is. Uh, Nafi of Medina, the other one is Ibn Kasir of Makkah, Ibn Amir of Damascus, and you can see these are the, their dates uh, in, in which they died. And the earliest is Ibn Amir, and he uh, is said to have existed in the time of Usman also, although uh, he never saw the Prophet. But some people say that he had a he had a very long life. Uh, other than that, you can see the the latest person is is Imam Nafi who died in 169. And is there another uh, number seven here? Because there are total seven. Maybe it has been missed out. No. Yeah. So what? There is another person in number seven. He also belongs to Kufa, and his name is Ali ibn Hamza al Kisai. So these are the seven famous readers. And what happened was, just to give a recap, remember the Prophet here, the companions here, the Tabeun here, and then came these people called the famous reciters. Now what they found was. That they are receiving multiple readings from the same person, Ibn Masud, saying something and reaching that person, another person reporting one of his students and again reaching that person, and again that person, and again that person. Similarly, another reciter, for example, if this is Nafi of Medina, so he has received those reports from Ibn Masud, 
in through various channels. And then, for example, we have uh, the Meccan reciter Ibn Kasir. So he would also typically receive something from a companion, uh, one thing, another chain, and still another chain. So they would be receiving multiple readings by, by the time it reached them. And therefore, they were now in a position, or they assumed themselves in a position that they could, they could give preference to either one of them. So just as the Imams of Fiqh were invested with great authority that they are the Imams of Fiqh and they can give a verdict, these seven, uh, seven readers, these seven famous readers were regarded with great acclaim. They were regarded as great readers and they are called sahib ikhtiyar which means that when they received multiple readings from the same companion, they could actually give preference to any one of them. They were given this authority that you can choose between this between the best variation in other words if you have five variations you can choose any one of them of course they had their principles of that preference and choice i'm not going to go into them but now this resulted in companions actually in in these people actually producing a whole set of variant readings previously we had individual people having different readings now came these reciters what they did was they compiled each and every verse in a manner that they received from the previous from the previous companions and they also gave preference to one of them so this is how the reading of nafi came into being the reading of ibn kasir came to being all the way down for every verse of the quran for every verse they had a variant and for every variant they decided their own preference so whole sets of readings came into being and that is how we had the qiraat of nafi we had the Qirat of Ibn Kasir. We had the, the Qirat that we follow is the Qirat of Asim. And since his student is called Hafs, so we have the Qirat of Hafs from Asim. Similarly, we have the Qirat of Warsh from Nafi. Remember the five Qurans? They were actually labeled through these famous readers. And this happened that these seven people became famous. It's not that they were uh, not other readers as well. Just like the, there were other jurists like uh, besides uh, Imam Hanifa and Shafi, those four became very prominent because the state adopted their fiqh. In a very similar way, these seven became very prominent for certain reasons and they actually were responsible for synthesizing a whole set of readings from Alif Lam Mim to Van Nas. Each and every variation that they got for every verse of the Quran, they sought to give preference to only one. So what was multiple here became confined as things got going in the later part of uh, the third or fourth century. Sir, were they not aware of that what was happening in parallel that Nabi has given the last uh, Kirat and then hundreds you see, and thousands of people? This, this, this distinction had already become blurred much before them. Somewhere between the companions and before them, they actually, since they were given this, this data that anything which comes from khabr -e wahid has to be accepted. It cannot be rejected. So the same position was actually adopted <coughs> by them as well. What, what was adopted by their predecessors. So in this way, we had the whole sets of reading. Now, if I can tell you the five Qurans that, that exist today, two of them are fr from him. One of his students is called Na uh, Warsh. The other one is called Kalun. So we, the two Qurans that exist today are because of his two students. And then uh, we have another Quran uh, that we are very uh, uh, that we uh, are very aware of. He's, that is the Quran of Hafs from Asim, and this is the Quran which is read in 98 percent, uh, uh, 98 percent population of the Muslim Ummah. Then we have the Quran of Duri from Abu Amr, which is as you would have uh, seen, it is found in uh, parts of uh, Basra and in parts of Yemen. And similarly, we have another one from Hisham, who is the student of Ibn Amir. Mm -hmm. by Tawatur, in some versions was being replaced by uh, varying readings uh, from khabr -e wahid No, that's not what you're saying. Okay. At the moment, what we are trying to synthesize is that how come the reading of Nafi ibn Kasir ibn Amir, as it was called, got inserted into the books of Tafsir. So when you when you f go so through a book of the, books of the rather than the version of Quran. That's, we have yet to touch upon that. Okay. That's going to follow right after <laughs> that. But 
this is how readings of the seer actually mention when they say that the quran was also read like this, like this mm -hmm. they refer to to a person like this okay uh, could you turn the slide now now is some of the very important thing that we, you need to understand and that is that uh, as you would have seen that there are five places from which these readings originated kufa basra mecca medina and damascus now lo and behold none of these readings are found today in these areas none of them none of them they were not forcibly exterminated one would have believed that why is it that mecca about or uh, about medina for example it is said that nafe was the person who originated in medina and he actually advocated the reading of medina if this was the case then why is it that today medina does not read the quran according to the reading of nafe there could have been two explanations either it was very confined which of course does not seem likely or it seems or it's, it it would, it would have been the fact that it was forcibly exterminated from that area when we say that the reading of nafe originated from medina as you can see from the chart why is it that medina is not reading the reading of nafe today so there could have been this explanation that either it was forcibly turned out of that place or maybe it had such a narrow influence that with a change in reader with a change in scholar the reading also changed and this is precisely what what, what actually happened you will find out that these readings transmitted themselves in two ways amongst the masses the way it is being done today these readings were transmitted through tawatur as we have received them however in scholarly circles the transmission was ahad the way ahadith are being transmitted and is still going on in that way so we have a scenario of dual transmission the tawatur the mutawatir quran which we know is being transmitted through the qiratul amma amongst the masses and the ahad qurans being transmitted not to us because you never knew that there was a quran like this you never knew you never knew only the scholars knew that so that 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 stint if if there is for example 80% or 90% of the people who can recall the masses amongst the masses we only had the qiratul amma it was only amongst the scholars that besides the qiratul amma certain ahad readings also were there because for them it was imperative that if they reject these ahad readings they'll have to reject ahadith also so what about this side okay now now the side exists that how come a whole country actually adopted a particular reading so i'm now going to uh, could you turn the slide no the the where 98% of the people are, are they also believing that the quran we have is also through khabar ahad the quran others have no the one we have No, no, no. They don't so, sir. Actually, the scholars say that all these seven, most of them say that all these six or seven or five readings are mutawatir, and there are other people who contest this opinion and say they cannot be mutawatir because they are not, and there are still other people who say, no, okay, it is only the consonantal text which is mutawatir. As far as the declension in Arab are concerned, they vary from person to person and country to country. Okay, let me finish this first. Okay, otherwise, uh, uh, we'll not be able to finish this off. Okay, now you can clearly see there is there is this instance in which when the Quran was being transmitted, we have a scenario of dual transmission. Amongst the masses, it was always the the Tawatur reading, and still is prevailing. Amongst the scholars, it was the Mutawatir as well as as the Ahad reading. It is still prevailing, and this. can be very very nicely demonstrated in areas in which scholars never went with the quran but masses went with the quran for example malaysia for example indonesia for example india so india malaysia indonesia it was the masses who infiltrated who brought islam who carried the quran and in all these areas there is not a single variant reading it is only in those areas which were made centers by the scholars like kufa basra baghdad uh makkah medina in which they originated but as soon as the scholar left that place the reading went with him 
and this also explains the fact that if Medina had a particular reading of Imam Nafe, as soon as Nafe or his students left that place, the Qiratul Ama was already existing in the, in the masses everywhere. So it displaced it very easily. However, amongst the scholarly circles, as the scholar changed, the reading would change. So we have a scenario of dual transmission and this I think uh, is a very important note that we have to make. And the thing that I'd also like to point out now is now how come whole countries, whole countries follow a particular reading. For example, Morocco follows the reading of Nafe. So one would expect that at least if these are Ahad and scholars know that they are Ahad, why is it that they are still being uh, preferred? So my answer is very sim simple and in fact, this is not just my answer. Uh, when I went to Morocco uh, many years ago to find an answer to this, I got my answer uh, very easily from discussion with the shiukh there. The f what happened is, uh, now this is the, the very last part of our, of our discussion and then we can actually wind it up and leave some of the questions to your uh, session of question and answer session. But uh, when I finish this part, uh, you'll have an answer to the first two questions uh, regarding, uh, the, uh, regarding the uh, origin of these variant readings in the tafsir books and why did a particular country adopt a whole set of variant readings. Now, just bear this in mind. Uh, there was a time in North Africa in which the fiqh of Imam Malik started to become dominant. This was the sec second century. So just as we have the Hanafi fiqh in Pakistan and the Saudis have the Hanbali fiqh, uh, the fiqh of Ibn Taymiyyah, we, there was a time in which Imam, Nafi, uh, Imam Malik's fiqh became very prominent in the North African belt. You know the African horn? It's like this, Africa. This, this is called the African horn. From west to east, to east to west, we have Sudan, Egypt, Morocco, Tanzania, uh, Gambia, Senegal, so all these countries, just look at look them up on a map and you see that all they are all lying in one line. So what happened was in one particular era of time, which I actually determined, it was somewhere around 270 Hijra AH. What happened was that the fiqh of Imam Malik was adopted as a state policy by the king or by the Qazi of that era, just as we in our part in Pakistan at one time adopted the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa. So we are called Hanafis. In a very similar way, people who follow, people who live in Morocco, they are called the Malikis because they lived in the era of Imam Malik. Uh, they actually adopted the fiqh of Imam Malik. Now, <laughs> very interesting thing that I'm just going to tell you. Imam Malik was a teacher of Nafi regarding hadith. Nafi is the same person who had a complete set of readings which I just pointed out to you. So Imam Malik was a teacher of Imam Nafi in the case of hadith and in the case of Quran it was the reverse. Nafi was the teacher of Imam Malik. This was very common in those earlier times in which people would be students and teachers at the same time in different disciplines. So in the discipline of Hadith, uh, in, the, uh, in the discipline of uh, uh, Fiqh actually, you can see that it was Imam, uh, sorry, uh, in the discipline of Hadith, uh, it was Imam Malik who actually read his Muatta of Imam, uh, his, uh, that he actually authored, read it out and Imam Nafi actually uh, read it out to him. So that Imam Nafi became a student of, of Imam Malik in matters of Hadith. In the matters of the Quran, it was the reverse. Nafi had a set of readings, remember, one of the one set which he had compiled by his time, and he was the teacher of Imam Malik in matters of Hadith, uh, in matters of the Quran. So when they adopted the Maliki fiqh in North Africa, people said, "Well, since we have adopted the fiqh of Imam Malik, let us also adopt the Quran of Imam Malik's teacher." And since Imam Malik's teacher was actually Nafi. It was basically a royal decree in around 270 Hijra in which they said that since we are adopting the fiqh of Imam Malik, let us follow the teacher of Imam Malik in the Quran. And hence we find that in this particular uh, time of, uh, of, uh, of this world, actually the reading of Imam Nafi was enforced in the empire. It was 
practically adopted. It's, it's not that uh, 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 people actually uh, were left to their own will. It was actually enforced in the whole empire. So here we have a scenario in which this, this is a dual transmission in normal circumstances in which the reading of an imam uh, travels with, with, with him wherever he goes except uh, where, uh, where we have these masses, we have people who are reading the Qur'atul Amma. However, there are areas of this world and I can tell you regarding each of these 11 countries that for each of them a certain reading was adopted by the state authorities and enforced in their ter territory. So the reason why those 11 countries have a different Quran was that some of them adopted the Quran of Nafi, some of them adopted the uh, Quran of Nafi's one student who is Warsh, another of Kaloon, some of them adopted the Quran of Duri and actually enforced them in their empire for similar reasons because they thought that if, if they are following the fiqh of a certain person then the, t then the Quran which that person follows or gives respect to must also be enforced. So in this, uh, in, in, in a nutshell, I can now say that, that the first two questions, which you can clearly see, in my humble opinion, stand answered. Those 11 countries which have a different version of the Quran uh, have that version because that version was adopted by state authorities uh, on, for one reason or the other. And it was forcibly enforced in that territory because they thought that since, since they are following a f the fiqh of a particular person, then they should also follow the Quran of the same person, the Quran that he follows. And in this way, slowly and surely, as time passed along, these Qurans were enforced in those territories. And I think this answers the riddle also that why is it that countries in which uh, this never happened, like I gave you the example of Malaysia and Indonesia, Central Asia, in which this scenario never took place. Neither the Quran was enforced, nor the scholars came there. The only scenario was that the common man came there with the Qiratul Amma and the issue of variant readings never arose. So that is the reason that in Pakistan, in India, in Malaysia, you don't even know if there are variant readings. Because in those areas, the transmission of the Quran depended on the common, common masses. They were the ones who brought the Quran. However, even in Pakistan, in India and Malaysia, the scholars still have that tradition in which that Ahad Quran is also with them, but among the scholarly circles only. So, in the masses we have the general Quran that we all know, and in the scholars we have that Quran as well. And you would be surprised to know that there are competitions which are held in Pakistan and India, which are called the Saba Qirat competition, in which people who have remembered the Quran in other versions, their memory is tested. A contest is made, is, is, is uh, initiated in which people or, or hufas who have the various versions of the Quran in their memory, they are told to recite it from their memory. So you can see that even in these areas, the masses are going to, uh, are, uh, they only know the, the Qiratul Amma. And the scholars, they never teach that reading to the common masses. They never, because to them it has to remain amongst themselves. However, there are 11 countries where those readings were adopted. Why? Because the state decided that they have to follow those readings. So this uh, probably uh, brings me to the end uh, to give you an answer regarding this, the first and second question. And in a nutshell, the remaining eight questions, I can tell you that all those eight questions, the answer to all those eight questions actually lies in that, remember I said that there is this content called H plus H Hadith and history. So all those eight questions have arisen be because of reports either from Hadith or from history. And I have applied tools of historical criticism on both these areas and, uh, and have come to the conclusion that almost 80 to 90 percent of the content which has been transmitted regarding the history of the Quran through his Hadith and history is superfluous. Is is zaif and the remaining 10 or 20 percent actually has a different interpretation the content is correct i mean the the transmission is correct but the way it has been interpreted is wrong again i have made this uh, 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 this statement without actually qualifying it because i know that uh, that will require more detail but uh, my my purpose in delivering this uh, presentation to you was that for the remaining content you can easily consult uh, my detailed book because I have made my case 
and uh, and uh, try to explain it to you that these uh, eight the, the remaining eight questions generally have arisen because the because they have not been critically uh, viewed uh, in historical and hadith sources. Also, very quick question here. 